So we are going to continue our series, all of us. Rick has been in, and Billy and Noah, they've been doing an awesome job the past handful of Wednesdays and Sunday mornings. We're going to continue in that vein. And how many of you have been appreciating Rick's uh, commentary on worship and prayer and just ministering to God? That's been powerful. So we're going to dive more into that tonight. We're going to talk about worship as a weapon. Worship is a weapon if you're taking notes. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll jump into this tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to dive into what your word says about worship. That when we worship, it's actually a weapon against the enemy of our soul and the enemies in our lives that come against us to try to bind us. We thank you that we got to worship before this message, and I thank you that we're going to get to worship after and put into practice what we're about to learn tonight. We love you. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying and what you're doing tonight. It's in Jesus' name we all said, amen. amen. Awesome. Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 43, verse 7. If you were here last Wednesday night, I loved Rick's message because he said worship, and this is from the Lord speaking to him in his, his, his time recovering from his illness. The Lord was speaking to him, why do you worship? Why do you pray? And, and the gist of it was worship of God is not a means to the end. Worship is the end. Why? Because God is not a means to an end. God is the end. Amen? Did you know you were created to worship? You were actually created, you exist in this room today, primarily to worship and glorify the Lord, to enjoy Him. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed them. Yes, I have made them. So God is saying of Himself and of His creation, I have created each person primarily for my glory. What does that mean? To worship Him, to enjoy who He is, to receive His love, and to love Him in return. And I love this because if you look at something called the Westminster Confession, I was looking at this the other day, it's a statement of faith from hundreds of years ago. And it's a series of questions and answers that kind of outline the, the main and plain of what we believe about the Bible well, and, and what the Bible teaches about God. And the first question is this, what is the chief end of man? Meaning what is the chief, what is the ultimate goal for us being here right now? And then it answers the question. The chief end of man, the chief goal of humanity is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Don't you love that? Our ultimate purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So it's that context of relationship that we were called to before sin entered the picture in the Garden of Eden. We are called to operate in that relationship and out of that relationship, live our lives and subdue the earth, but always in the context of worshiping God. Why? Because He is our purpose. He is our purpose, to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. But because worship is our original purpose, how many of you know worship is powerful? And when you understand, and when I understand, the primary reason that we exist is for that relationship and worshiping and Him pouring out His love on us and us pouring out our love back to Him in worship. When we realize that and when we give ourselves to it in our day in, day in, out, day in and out lives, what begins to happen is you and I begin to get transformed from the heart. We begin to be transformed in how we feel in our relationships, and how we conduct ourselves, and what we give our time to. When we worship, it begins to transform and affect every area of our lives. Why? It's our primary calling. And so tonight, we're talking about worship being a weapon. How many of you know we are in a battle right now? How many of you have been feeling the battle in recent days? Yeah. We are in a spiritual war, and Paul talks about that in Ephesians 6 that we are in a, in a war against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's a pretty significant enemy, right? Principalities, powers, evils, heavenly things coming against the people of God. That's a powerful and significant enemy that we need to take seriously in our lives. But we're going to look tonight of, of, about, about a couple reasons why worship is a weapon, and that when we enter into worship, our defenses against the enemy are strengthened. And we talked about the, 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 the Ephesians 6 verse that talks about the, the armor of God. 
And when you look at each of those pieces of of the armor and the, the weapon of the sword of the Spirit, when we worship, our defenses and our offenses are strengthened. And we're going to look up at that tonight. So the first point, if you're taking notes, is this. Worship is a weapon against the enemy's strongholds in your life. Worship is a weapon against the enemy's strongholds in your life. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. Let's just kind of define what a stronghold is, and then we'll define what we're talking about tonight. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, this is the popular verse where Paul's talking about spiritual warfare and strongholds and what that really means. And he says, for, the, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's, there's that word strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so when we look at that verse, Paul kind of defines for us what a stronghold is. It's ideas and concepts about God that are not true. It's ideas and concepts even about your own identity in Christ that are not true. And that when we buy into those lies of the enemy about God and lies about ourselves, it creates a stronghold. It creates a barrier. It creates this fortress around us, keeping us back from the freedom that you and I were promised in Christ. That's a stronghold. And that's what we're talking about tonight, that worship can break. It's easy to allow fear and anger and depression to, to rise up and just to, to, throughout our daily lives, we accumulate all these different disappointments and discouragements and, and different things that happen to us from day to day. And if we're not careful, what can happen is those things can start piling up and speaking to us lies about God, lies about ourselves. And unknowingly, we wake up one day and we feel anxious, we feel worried, we feel angry, we feel despair, and we're wondering why. That's because those strongholds are being set up. But there's a solution. Acts 16, 25 to 26 is one of my favorite verses as I was studying this. This is Paul and Silas. They were thrown into prison for preaching Jesus in the book of Acts. And and it says this, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, just get this picture. Paul and Silas are thrown into this dungeon with a ton of other people that have done horrible things. It's this dark, dingy dungeon, and it's, it's horrible. And most people in that dungeon, most people in that jail, would be feeling anything but hope, right? They would be feeling depression, despair, hopelessness, frustration, anger, hatred, just, just feeling like there's no future for them. But what does Paul and Silas do? They decide to set their eyes on the solution rather than looking at just the problem. So they set their eyes not on their own shackles, not on the fact that they're in a jail, but they set their eyes on Jesus and begin to worship and begin to pray. And this is what happens. Suddenly, and so it says, and the prisoners were listening to them do this, to pray and worship. Verse 26, suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately... All the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Immediately, everyone's chains were loosed. The doors of the prisons were opened. Why? They worshipped God. They put their their minds focused on the solution rather than just the problem. You see the parallel in our lives. When we are going through trials, when we have adversity, when we go through the day in, day out mundaneness, when we feel insignificant, when we feel the lies of the enemy coming against us, we feel like we're shackled, don't we? We feel like we're in that prison, that jail cell that we can't get out of, and we're wondering how we do it. We try to to force our way out, but we can't do it. But when we turn our eyes to Jesus, like Paul and Silas did, when we begin to worship, when you begin to lift your voice and worship Jesus in the midst of the circumstances, what begins to happen? Your shackles begin to fall off. The Lord begins to shake the jail cell that you've been in and set you free and set me free. But not just that. What does the verse say? What does the verse go on to say? It's not just them that got free, is it? All the other prisoners' chains fell off them in that moment. And all of the other prisoners' jail cell doors began to open. And I don't know about you, but the the times where I feel like I'm the most influential in in ministry and in, in ministering to other people, And being impactful toward other people are the moments that I am most free. What do I mean by that? 
The times where I feel the most free in my heart, the times where I'm most connected to God and to God's truth about how he feels about me, what he thinks about me, in those moments when I'm most free, I'm the most influential because everyone around me is going to start getting free in those moments too. And everyone around you, when you begin to get free, when you begin to connect again and again and again with the truth of God as you worship him, as you put your eyes and focus on him as the solution to every problem, your heart becomes free. But because you're free, everywhere you go, freedom begins to follow you. Chains begin to fall. Prison doors begin to open. Why? Because you set your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Worship is powerful. So how does this work? To see how worship breaks the strongholds of the enemy and how it's a weapon, we have to look at the enemy's strategies. And we kind of have already kind of talked about it. But what is the enemy's strategy? I, I'd like to ask you this question. I've thought about this. Throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament specifically, we see this. We see after Jesus died and rose again, and after we put our faith in Jesus, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, the Bible says. After we put our faith in Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, I give you power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He said he gathered his disciples together and gave them power over all unclean spirits to cast them out. And in Hebrews, it talks about defeating and destroying the devil. So if the devil has no authority over a believer, how does he attack us still? If he has no authority legally in the kingdom of God over you, which is very true, how is he still attacking us? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought about that? If these things are true about me in Christ, why am I still getting attacked? Why am I still feeling bombarded by the enemy? And we do go through seasons of intense, intensified spiritual warfare, but there's a specific reason in this context that we get attacked sometimes by the enemy. How does the enemy attack Christians if he has no authority? Taking our attention off of God and his truth and placing our attention on his lies. Placing our attention on the lies of the enemy. And when we come into agreement with those lies, we give him legal access to our lives. Again, he has no authority over believers. The enemy has been stripped of his power the moment you said yes to Jesus. But we can give him that legal access to our lives by coming into agreement with him. How do we do that? Like I said, believing lies, unconfessed sin, unforgiveness in our hearts. All of those things is le like leaving a back door open to the enemy. I used to live in Pleasanton with my family before we moved <clears throat> and before I got married. And we had this beautiful neighborhood, and I would go on walks and go on runs periodically throughout the neighborhood. And as I would, I would see, I would pass this one wall, my neighbor's kind of fence, it was more like a wall, a barrier that you can't see through. But every time I would pass that one section of his backyard where that wall was, he had these two humongous dogs. They were huge and terrifying. <laughs> they were massive, and, and they would jump up kind of not over the wall, but enough so I could see their massive gargantuan heads, enough to tim intimidate me. <clears throat> so they would jump up and they would bark these loud barks and just jump up and just kind of watch me pass by as I was running and I would run a little faster to get away from them. It was terrifying, right? But they never once attacked me. Why? Because there was a barrier. There's a wall there. There's a boundary line there that they can't cross. They don't have the authority. They don't have the ability to cross that boundary line. They have a lot of bark, but they don't have a lot of bite because of that wall. But what would happen is if, if, if I was crossing, I was, I was walking by, I was on my, my run, and they started barking, and I was like, you know what, they seem friendly enough. They've never attacked me before. I'm going to go and, and let them out of the fence. I'm going to unlock the door and let them out and see if they want to uh, play or something, want to play fetch. <laughs> is that a good idea? <laughs> At that point, I'm giving them access to me, right? And we see the parallel. When we do that with, with our lives with the enemy, the enemy has no legal access, no authority to our lives, but when we open the door, when we open the fence, so to speak, we're giving him that full, uh, full access and that full authority to do, to, to mess with our lives and to do with us what he wants. And so a lot of times when I'm feeling all, uh, discouraged and despair and uh, a little intensified attacks of the enemy, I'll stop and I'll say, Lord, what, what's the root of this? What's the cause of this? Are there anything, any open doors that I've left in my life? And a lot of times it's because I'm in agreement 
with a lie that I didn't even know I was in agreement with. But that's, the, that's how this kind of works. He has no authority unless we give it to him. And how does that relate to worship? When we worship, and when we sing songs to God, and when we f- focus our attention on him, again, we're, we're lifting our eyes off of the lies, off of the problems, and putting us, putting our eyes back on him. We're putting our attention back on his truth in replacement of his lies. My wife Adriana and I are, are, are trying to worship more together. So on my days off, so we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time with the Lord worshiping together, and then we'll go off on our own and, and spend our quiet time, our devotional time with the Lord. But I remember one time we were, uh, about a month ago, we were worshiping together, and the song started to play, and I wasn't really feeling anything, wasn't spe- feeling super spiritual or anything like that. But as the song began to play, and as I started singing along with the song, even though I wasn't really feeling much, I began to experience this deep emotion inside of my heart. I felt like there was a breaking happening, a good breaking. I started sensing God's love, God's presence. There was just this refreshing feeling started to wash over me, and I started to cry. And I wasn't sure why. I wasn't sure what was happening. But as I reflected on it, I realized that I came into agreement with things in my heart around that time that weren't true. I started believing things about God's uh, heart toward me that weren't true. Like he, he, he wants me to get my act together and I'm not doing good enough and compared to this other person, I'm, I'm not measuring up and all those things that can sneak into our minds and our hearts from day to day. Those things crept into my mind and I, I wasn't even aware of it until I started declaring the truth. And when I started declaring the truth about God in worship, it confronted those lies and broke them. And that feeling I was feeling was the freedom of God coming to my heart when I came back into agreement with his truth. So power, uh, worship is a powerful weapon against the enemy's strongholds. That's number one. Number two is this. Worship is a weapon against self-reliance. And that might sound weird, but I'm going to unpack that in just a minute. Worship is a weapon against self-reliance. Second Chronicles 20, 22. Powerful verse. I'll, I'll give you some background on it a little bit, and then we'll read uh, actual verse 22. And in context, Second Chronicles 20, King Jehoshaphat, he was the, the king of Judah at the time. Great name. And in this context, in, in, in chapter 20, he was, he was being threatened by invading armies. They were gathering together, they were pulling together, and they were going to attack Jehoshaphat and his land. And so he's freaked out. He called a fast around all the land. He was praying, crying out to God for deliverance. And I'm just going to highlight a few verses throughout this, and then we'll get to our main verse 22 in a second. Verse 12, King Jehoshaphat says, O Lord our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love that. So he, he has no power. He acknowledged he had no power. He acknowledged that he had no idea what to do, but our eyes are on you. Verse 15, God speaks back to him. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through a prophet and says, Listen, all of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord your God, Do not be afraid nor be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. I think we need to remember that sometimes. The battle is not ours. The battle is God's. And then let's jump down to uh, verse 21 and 22. So he goes on, he's setting up for battle, he, he's full of faith now, he's believing God's promise. He says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, those who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Verse 22, this is our verse. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people that had come against Judah. And they were defeated. Powerful. So he sent out worshipers in the midst of this terrifying army. He acknowledged, I I don't have the the power to overcome this enemy. And even if I did, I wouldn't know how to do it. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And then they decided to worship God in the midst of their enemies. They started to worship God in the midst of their greatest trials. And God, as they began to sing, set ambushes among the enemy and destroyed their enemies. Destroyed their enemies. 
See, worship requires trust. And that's what I, what I gleaned from this passage is worship requires that we trust God. When we transfer our trust from ourselves over to God, guess what that's called? It's called faith. There's something about faith that moves the heart of God and he acts on our behalf. He fights for us. Jesus could do no miracles in his hometown. Why? Because of their unbelief, because of their lack of faith. But when we worship, we're, we're setting our attention on Jesus again. We're, we're setting our, our attention on the one who can fight for us. We're choosing not to trust in our own strength, which is really hard to do, <laughs> to not try to rely on your own strength, to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and just try to make things happen and to work through our own problems in and of ourselves. That self-sufficiency, that self-reliance that we so value as a culture in America. We try to do that, but we, come, we become burned out by doing that. When we worship, we declare God's ability in the midst of our situations, and God responds to that faith by fighting our battles. How many times do we rely on our own strength? When we have the God who, who commands the armies of heaven, waiting for us just to reach out to him, waiting for us to worship, waiting for us to turn our attention off of ourselves, waiting for us to turn our attention off of our own abilities and put it on him. He says, if we would just look at me, he's saying, if you would just look at me, if you would just worship me, if you would just trust in me, I would fight your battles for you. I would send ambushes against the enemies of your soul that are trying to afflict you. It's about that faith, that trust in the Lord. Throughout scripture, we see uh, that contrast of people that try to do things in and of our own, uh, their own strength, and then people that wait on God and wait on his strength. And we see what happens when Israel didn't, didn't talk to God, didn't ask God about going to various battles and didn't worship him and weren't obeying him, what happened? They went out to battle and they were defeated. When even some of the greats of faith tried to do things apart from God's strength, what happened? They fell flat on their face. Moses tried to act in his calling as deliverer. He killed a guy and had to spend 40 years in the wilderness hiding before his calling came to pass. Joseph promoted himself and said, hey guys, I, got, I had this great dream that, that I'm going to be greater than all of you and you're going to all bow down to me. And he spent the next years just going through it, going through some hard, hard times. See, when we try to be, be strong enough for God, when we try to just force our way and say, God, I got it, I got, I got a ton of issues and problems right now, but I got it taken care of. I'm just going to push through. I'm going to just shut down and push through. Burnout is going to be the result to that. Despair is going to be the result to that. Psalm 33, 16 to 18, I, I love this verse. It says, No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. Verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his mercy. I have good news for you tonight. God is not looking for you to be strong enough. God is not looking for your own abilities to be good enough and sufficient enough and just, just, just try harder, just do more. The good news tonight is he's not looking for your strength. He's looking for your dependence. He's not looking for your abilities to overcome by yourself. He's looking for your trust. Like it says here, he's, he's not impressed by our strength. He's not impressed by the strength of, of our own arm, but he's looking on the one who fears him and on those who hope in his mercy. And for myself, I've kind of realized there's a good test for determining whether I'm depending on my own strength or whether I'm depending on God's strength. And here's the test that I use for myself. When I, when I take a second to look inside and say, do I feel mostly worn out? Do I feel mostly weary? Do I wake up in the morning and feel mostly anxious and fearful and angry and frustrated and like I just want to throw in the towel and go do something else and not keep pressing and not keep going forward in God's plan for my life? If I'm starting to feel that way on a consistent basis, then that's an indication and that's a clear sign that I'm depending on my own strength and not God's and that is not what Christianity is all about. Amen? God is looking for complete dependence from start to finish. It's all about acknowledging like King Jehoshaphat did. 
I don't have the strength to overcome this enemy. I don't even know how to overcome this enemy, but my eyes are on you. That's how we got saved, acknowledging we can't, Jesus. I can't be good enough, but you can, and I trust you. That's how we're transformed now into Jesus' image. God, I can't force myself to change, but you can change me and complete dependence upon him. From start to finish, he's looking for that dependence. So when we worship, we transfer our trust from ourselves onto God. We stop trusting in, in our own abilities and we remind ourselves of God's ability. We remind ourselves, even though we're, we're, we're weak, he's strong. Even though we're, we're struggling, he is able. Even though we're, we're powerless, he's powerful. And he's going to come to our rescue if we trust him. Worship is a weapon against self-reliance. Third point, final point. Worship is a weapon against fear. Worship is a weapon against fear. Turn to Matthew 14. We're going to read 28 to 31. This is the story that we've heard so many times of Peter walking on the water. Jesus is, has left them, and he was praying on the mountain, and the disciples went on in the boat. And around that, that late hour, Jesus came walking on the water. They thought he was a ghost. They were freaked out. And then Peter was like, hey, I want to walk on the water. And Jesus is like, oh, come on then. So he starts walking out on the sea. He's walking on the water, defying natural law by the power of God. A miracle was taking place in that moment for Peter. But what happened, we all know. He started looking at the wind. He started looking at the waves around him. And what happened? He began to sink. He began to sink. Matthew 14, 28 to to 31 Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. Jesus said, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And he began sinking, crying out, saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And there's that same parallel for our circumstances. I think it's easy for me, especially, to keep my attention only on the things that God hasn't done yet in my life. To keep my attention on the the difficult situations that are coming up in my relationships with people. To keep my attention on what hasn't happened yet in my life that I've wanted to see. All these different situations that that come up, the, the person that talked to me wrong, that I didn't like their tone, all these little things come up and it's easy to take my eyes off of Jesus in those moments and to put my attention on all those things. But when we start doing that, when we put our attention on that, how many of you know whatever we focus on the most is what your emotions are going to align with? Whatever our attention is set on, that's where our heart is going to go. And so if we're feeling consistently disappointed, consistently anxious and frustrated and angry, I would recommend taking a step back and saying, God, what is going on inside of my heart? What am I focusing on? Because it's not you. It's the wind and the waves. See, when we focus on the wind and the waves, our hearts begin to sink just like Peter started sinking. Our hearts begin to go into this drowning mode where we feel like every day we're just barely making it. We're barely getting by. We feel frantic. We feel exhausted. And the whole time Jesus is standing there waiting for us to turn our attention back to him. What does this look like? to turn our attention back to him. Sometimes I think we just need to become aware of his presence again. I think sometimes we we have, because of the language that we use in, in Christianity, I think it's easy to think that, well, God goes away and then he comes back at different times. So we have to ask, ask him to come back because in, in our times of, of feeling alone, it's because God's gone away and we need to find out ways to, to be a good person, to, to do a lot of good things to, so, so that he can come near to us again, and we can feel his closeness. So we we associate not feeling his presence with his absence. We think he's he's far away, he's not with me anymore, we need to ask him, hey, come back, come back. And the good news tonight is that the Bible makes clear, Jesus never leaves us. Jesus never forsakes us. He's never left you once, he never will leave you once. He's the one who's always and ever present. He's with us, and he's for us. 
That's the good news. The problem is not that he left, but we took our eyes off of him. Adriana, my wife and I, we just had a beautiful baby boy a few months ago named Isaiah. He's amazing. Thank you. He's amazing. We're having a lot of fun and not sleeping a lot, so that's fun. <clears throat> but a lot of times what we'll do is, is he'll be in his little bassinet or uh, a little, be on the couch or something, and I'll just be sitting there and we'll be just staring at each other, smiling at each other, making faces, talking. I'll just start talking to him. He'll make little cooing noises back to me. So fun. But then he'll just, he'll get distracted and he'll start looking around the room. He'll start scanning the room, he'll look at the ceiling, he'll look at the TV, he'll look at my desk over in the corner, and he'll just start looking around. And after a few minutes, as he's looking around, he starts to cry. He starts to, to whimper, he starts to become scared. Why? Because he took his attention off of me and he felt like I was gone. He felt like I wasn't there anymore because he wasn't looking at me. He wasn't conscious, he wasn't aware of my presence, so to speak. And because of that, he started to become fearful. He started to become worried. And then I'll just say, hey, buddy, I'm over here. I'm still here. I haven't moved. And he'll turn his head back to me, and he'll smile, and he'll, he'll just have peace again in his heart. Why? Because he knows that I'm still there. And isn't that like us? God never leaves you. God never forsakes you. But sometimes we turn our attention to other things going on around us. And he's like, hey, Hey, buddy, hey, guys, I'm right here. I'm still here. And when we turn our attention back to him, we start to feel his presence again. I think that's why a lot of times we'll feel his presence at conferences, at retreats, the mountaintop experience, right, that we all love. And I've always wondered, why does it go away when we go back home? <laughs> that's so frustrating to me. And you know what I, I started to think, and as I was pouring over the word, some of my conclusions, there can be more than one, of course. But I think it's... It's because at a retreat and at conferences from day, from, from morning to evening, you're focused on the Word of God. From morning to evening, you're focused in on God's presence. You're, you start the morning with worship. You start the morning with the, the, uh, an hour-long sermon. Then you go to lunch and you, you, you study the Bible. You talk to, to other guys or other women about what you heard that morning. Then you go to another session in the afternoon. Then you go to another session in the evening. And it's powerful times of worship, powerful times in the Word. And what's your attention on all day? Jesus. So what do you feel? You feel his presence. You feel his nearness. See, this is why I don't think he goes away and then comes back. It's that we're not conscious of him. And when we become conscious of him again, like I mentioned earlier in that time of worship at home, I wasn't aware of his presence until I started worshiping. But when I worshiped, I felt his nearness. Why? My attention got back on him. He doesn't leave us, amen? Worship is a weapon against fear. Worship is a weapon against fear. James 4, verse 8, we're, we're drawing near to the end here. It says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Come near to God come near, and he will come near to you. Or draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. And again, that can seem like a, a geographic coming near, like come, come closer to God and he'll come closer to you. But do you know that that's actually relational language? He's talking about coming near in a relational sense like you would in a relationship. Meaning, give it your full attention. Be fully present in that relationship. Again, it's not that I go away and I come back to my spouse. It's that sometimes I'm present without being fully present, Right? being fully at attention. So he's calling us to, be, uh, to keep our attention on Jesus. I'm going to close with a few practicals of how to apply this. And then we're going to actually put it into practice. We're going to worship with a few more worship songs in just a few minutes. And I want us to worship with an intentionality, knowing that, yes, God is the end in and of himself. He's the goal. But that worship is a powerful weapon against fear. Worship is a powerful weapon that demolishes the strongholds in our minds that creep in from day to day. Worship is a powerful weapon against the self-reliance that we get into, the dependence on ourselves that, that causes us to spin out of control and become exhausted rather than using the resources of heaven, trusting in God and watching him fight our battles for us. I want us to worship with that intentionality. 
Worship team, you can come out as we close. A few practicals for us. Just two quick ones, and then we're going to pray together. First practical is worship through the war. Worship through the war. What does that mean? When we worship through the war, 1 Peter 2.11 talks about the flesh warring against the spirit and how, how we're in a spiritual battle right now against our flesh. So as we even go into this time of worship, your flesh might not feel like it wants to worship. How many of you felt that before? I can't tell you how many times I come into a corporate worship setting and feel like I just don't want to worship. I feel like, God, I want to go home. I want to sleep. I'm tired. (laughs) I don't want to sing and, and do all these things right now. But I want to encourage us tonight to worship through the war in your own soul. Sometimes we need to stir ourselves up and say, you know what? Flesh, I'm going to put you to death. Fleshly desires that just want to zone out, I'm going to put you to death. Why? Because I know that when I worship, demons flee. When I worship, my strongholds are torn down, and I need that. And I'm going to worship God with all that I am. See, we need to be spirit-led and not flesh-led sometimes. And that requires putting to death our flesh, and we worship through that war. But final thing is to remember. Psalm 105.5 talks about that remembering the works of God. As we go into this time of worship, I want to encourage you to remember who God is and what he's done for you. Who God is and what he's done for you. Because that's the most powerful fuel for your worship, is when you get reconnected and you start declaring the goodness of God. And I've started doing this in worship settings now to where I don't just come in and sing songs and then just go away. No, I prepare myself. Even when the music's playing, I'll say, God, I thank you that you're merciful, gracious, slow to anger, of great kindness. You're full of goodness and truth. You're faithful to me. But I won't just do that. I'll, I'll recall to my memory the things that he's done for me. God, I thank you that last week I was discouraged and you, you sent that person to pray for me and to remind me of the truth. I thank you that you washed me in, in your love as I spent time in the prayer room this morning when I was, I was just kind of feeling down. Lord, I thank you just last week when, you were, when I was feeling forgotten about, you reminded me that you saw me and it changed everything. Remember your history in God. Remember what he's done for you, even in recent days. And let your worship be a response to that memory, amen?